uh, July 18th, I'm sorry, August 15th, 1995, uh, regular meeting of the Planning Board to order. Uh, first evening on uh, this evening's agenda is a, a comments on the minutes of the previous meeting of July 18th, 1995. Any correction or comments from any of the board members? Mr. Etzel? Uh, I'll move that the uh, minutes are approved as written. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. Thank you. Uh, next on this evening's agenda is several items of correspondence. Uh, first is an item, a, a letter from the town attorney regarding Fitzpatrick uh, application dealing primarily with the issue of the disputed boundary line. In summary, the, uh, the town attorney advises us that the boundary line uh, issue is a civil matter and, and not the purview of the planning board, uh, much as we discussed at our previous meeting. We have a letter from uh, Titcomb Associates from David Titcomb regarding uh, the boundary survey giving a uh, history of the uh, property uh, at, at three, uh, of Grand Jordan's property on Sky Dyer Road, including uh, issues related to the boundary dispute, and uh, I think is very, very helpful in any concerns that other board members may have with respect uh, to the issue of the boundary uh, dispute. Uh, as I had mentioned to the town planner when I received this uh, in going over the uh, agenda, uh, it's a very clear, concise, and straightforward letter, and, and one that uh, I've read many uh, letters from surveyors, one of, probably one of the clearest that I've ever, ever read. I think it's very helpful uh, to the matter at hand. Uh, we have a memo from the code enforcement officer regarding uh, uh, the zoning uh, issues related to uh, main wireless uh, application or pending application. Uh, Maureen has uh, included a uh, planning commissioner's June journal that has extensive information in regard to uh, planning and, and education, something that I know uh, the Maine Association of Planners has been involved with for several years or many years in, in the state of Maine. And lastly, we have uh, amendments previously approved uh, by the council uh, to the zoning ordinance. Uh, any comments with respect to that? Uh, when we proceed on old business then, first item on uh, this, evening, this evening's agenda uh, is the uh, Fitzpatrick Wetland Alteration Permit Public Access. Uh, and if Maureen could give us a little information, again, we've had a public hearing on this item. We've gone back to workshop and now we're back for our final review, I trust. Mr. Chair, as I have uh, in the past, I'll have to be recused due to a personal bias. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fitz, excuse me. <coughs> Mr. Fitzpatrick is requesting approval for a wetlands alteration permit for a driveway and also a public access way to recreate two lots off of Scott Dyer Road. Uh, the board did hold, um, did deem the application complete uh, on the site walk. There was a uh, public hearing last month and there was a request by to, for the applicant to make some changes to the alignment of the driveway and some other design issues. And he has done most of that in response to last month's comments. In addition, um, there's been a letter from uh, the attorney representing the abutter, the Whitakers, that you have on, your, on the podium this evening. And he's asking that since the plan has been revised since last month, that he have an opportunity to address the board and comment on the, on the proposal changes. In addition, there's also a letter on the podium from the land trust. Their concern is with the buffer that's proposed on the site they are requesting that the applicant add language to the plan that states that they are responsible for trimming the vegetation so it doesn't grow over the pedestrian pathway. And if they fail to do that, that the, that the land trust would have the right to do that, that trimming and pruning. Are there any questions? No, if, uh, <coughs> if you just make a brief uh, presentation to bring us up to speed on the uh, changes that you proposed since the uh, workshop meeting. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Owens McCullough, uh, civil engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, the last time we were before the board, I believe, was the August 1st uh, workshop meeting, uh, at which time we had an opportunity to discuss some proposed changes in the design, which is before you tonight. Uh, probably most pronounced is uh, we've shifted the roadway over, basically outside of the 15-foot easement, and put a secondary curve in the road 
to break up the visual alignment of the road. Uh, the back portion of the road is now about 30 to 32 feet um, off the side property line. Uh, the road in the front is completely out of the uh, easement area. Um, that's really the most significant change to the site that did require that we fill some more wetland area. I, I think we added the total area uh, that was disturbed would be about 4 1,500 square feet or 0.03 acres. Uh, it's more than the original, but I think the benefit of filling that uh, makes sense. Uh, that also allowed, by moving that road over, it allowed us to uh, go to the 20-foot radiuses at the entrance with a straight-in alignment, which I think takes care of what the fire chief was interested in uh, in the past. Uh, Maureen uh, indicated the land trust had some interest in some language about trimming the rows or ghosts. Uh, I've talked to Joel Fitzpatrick and he was agreeable to putting that on the plan. Um, basically making it, if the homeowners don't uh, do it, then the land trust would have the right to trim those rows or ghosts as needed. Um, also, the town's engineer, Fred Morin, had some um, housekeeping uh, items. Uh, one, we originally, when we first, originally he wanted us to put some uh, alignment on the road for a construction layout. And then when we added the second curve, he's now asked that we continue it on that, which makes sense, and we will certainly do that. Um, there were a few other items that dealt with uh, riprap aprons on some culverts, which makes sense, and we'll certainly do that. Uh, basically, we will comply with what he's asked in the memo. Um, Marine also uh, brought up an item about the uh, easement. Um, I, I think she's right. What we'll do is, I, the easement was drawn on here using a line weight that could mislead you to believe it's a property line, which wasn't the intent. It was intended to be an easement. Uh, with the easement portion, here's the property line for lot one. That easement would be, the, the pro lot one would own all the way to the Whitaker's property line uh, with the easement created. Uh, allowing common access over it, which we described in note 14. And I think in talking with Maureen, what we talked about doing was changing the line weight so it was more clear that it was an easement and not a property line. And we will certainly make that change, too. Um, is, that, is that about some of what we talked about? Okay. Um, I think that pretty much sums up the primary changes. Um, by kicking the road over, I think we helped with the uh, uh, keep increasing the buffer along the property line. I know there's been some concern about the location of the Whitaker's property line um, in this area here. Uh, from Tickham Associates provided a letter. Um, the applicant would like to maintain that the property line is here, but I guess an added advantage of moving that over, the driveway over, is it appears that if for some reason this went to some sort of civil matter, uh, the adjusted, if if the Whitaker's survey turned out to be correct, um, the road would still be on Fitzpatrick's property. So it kind of gave a safeguard there, although uh, we hope it won't go that way. Um, if it did kick over, then I assume the, the uh, land trust easement would also move over, and that would put that land trust easement down the, uh, the driveway. So there would still be, a, there'd still be room for that 15-foot corridor. It would be over on the driveway. It's, assuming that something happened with the property line. Again, the applicants um, maintaining that a surveyor, what a surveyor proposed as the property line. Um, is there any questions that I can answer? Does the board have any questions? Um, I have a question of Maureen. Uh, Maureen, since this is a public access waiver, is a right-of-way required as for the driveway or is an easement uh, acceptable by the ordinance? It's, it, it, fun it functionally is the same thing. And what, what Owens has got here is, is a right-of-way. The question I had is if you look at the plan, the line that shows the right-of-way is the same exact style of line as they used to define the property boundaries. So it, it could, there could be some confusion that what you're doing is, in fact, creating a separate lot that is 30 feet wide that's the right-of-way. And uh, what I asked Owen to do is if he could just make that a completely dashed line so it was clear that that was um, an easement or a right-of-way that sits on top of fee ownership, which is owned by Lot 1. And he agreed that that was always the intent and that they would be willing to change the plan. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, I guess a, a question that came up at the, uh, not the workshop, but prior to the workshop, was the issue of the buffer. Um, I think you've certainly shown uh, 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 adequate length of butter buffer, uh, but a concern that I have is the, the sort of um, start, the stiffness of it relative to sort of the wildness of the site and uh, the maturity of the other trees, and would ask that you uh, consider perhaps substituting some of the uh, uh, arborvitae for, say, a, a two inch or an inch and a half uh, shade tree whether it's a red maple or something that's appropriate to the soils for the site. And I would suggest that perhaps you do that, that you cluster some of the arborvitae together and provide at least two shade trees in that grouping and, uh, and mass the uh, uh, Rosa rugosa together as well so it doesn't look like a, a stiff foundation planting but is, is more naturalized to the area. You break up a, a couple of clusters of yeah, the arborvitae. Group them together and put in a couple of shade trees. So there's a variety of vegetation that's there, and it, and it looks like it once it, within five years will look like it's been there for quite a while. Uh, and the shade trees will be easy to maintain as they get uh, bigger. You can just prune prune the uh, lower branches. Uh, but other than that, I don't I don't have any other comments. Okay, Joel, you know, Lance. I if it would seem appropriate, what we could do is come up with that plan that we could get with Maureen. That she won't, you know, either her and I could work on it, or she could, you know, present it back in front of the board to make sure that that's, we're all on the same page. Which that's is, fine. Um, before we uh, have the vote, I'm asking if the uh, Butters attorney still wishes to uh, make a brief presentation to the board. Okay. Does the board have any objections? We're not reopening the public hearing. We're just offering you an opportunity to speak at this evening's meeting. I'd like to clarify one thing right up front, is that the Whitakers do not oppose Mr. Fitzpatrick's development at all costs. They oppose it to the extent that any of it ends up on their property, or to the extent that the easement to the Land Conservation Trust ends up on their property. And I understand and don't really disagree with the letter that you folks got from the town's attorney about property line disputes and civil matters and all of that. And I also don't disagree really with the Fitzpatrick planner's statement that the driveway, the gray area on their plan, appears now to be totally westerly of the Whitaker's boundary as they believe it exists. The issue right now is that if the Fitzpatricks go ahead and construct that development and you approve it for construction, there is not going to be a 15-foot easement available to the Land Conservation Trust. Uh, let's like to address that again because I think notwithstanding the town council's, town attorney's letter to you, you need to understand more clearly what is going on. Um, and I'd like to also to, to put in the record and give you several documents. The first document I'd like to give you is an affidavit prepared by me, and it recites my search of the records in the Registry of Deeds. And what this search shows, I think I described before, is that at one point a party by a Libby on the area shown in the applicant's plan and on all the, all the land that's turned in that area altogether. The first parcel carved out of that big piece was what is the Whitaker's property. And that property is the one that defined the farm road as the westerly boundary of that property. And as a matter of law, it is that farm road there, from there on forward that in fact defines the boundary. Um, Mr. Titcomb, the Titcomb letter that you referred to in your initial comments uh, refers to the first time of a straight boundary appearing being in 1950. In fact, the boundary was created back in 1902 when that parcel was carved out. And up until 1950, there was no deed showing a straight line. And in fact, the deed referred to in 1950 conveying the, was now, the applicant property and using a straight line doesn't convey title if the, if the grantor didn't have it in the first place. So the first, doc first document I have to submit is my own affidavit detailing that title. The second document I would like to submit is an affidavit of the Sears surveyor. I'm sorry, the, the Whitaker surveyor. Um, and I, we've already submitted to the planner, and I will submit to the board also, an additional 
plan of the product being. This was completed literally today. And there's a picture on this plan, a BC balance detection on the boundary. Uh, we're all dealing with here. That is a formal survey. The boundary is not premised, as you can see from the plan, upon what the Whitakers put in for stakes. The surveyor states on that plan that he inspected the area of the boundary on the, on the land, and his affidavit, which I'm also submitting, recites that in trying to locate the boundary, he looked the same way that I did, and he goes on to recite that he inspected two aerial photographs of the area. The first photograph he identifies is a photograph in the town's record, uh, done for tax purposes in 1956. And I'm giving the board a copy of that photograph. straight line drawn in red which shows where the applicant claims the boundary is. And you can see clearly from that 1976 photograph that the farm road is not along that straight line. It is westerly of it, just as the Whitakers have been saying it is. And the critical thing I think about the photograph, again, is if you match that up with the one that's on the bulletin board here, I think you can see why I'm saying to you that if you approve the plan as it's on the board, there is not going to be a separate easement area. Uh, the Whitakers are not going to give up their property. The easement encumbers the Grand Jordan property. It does not encumber their property. So I'm not quite sure how you're going to finally issue your approval, but if you approve the uh, developer putting his driveway where it shows on his plan, um, and he goes forward and does it, the Whitakers aren't going to complain where that driveway is but they're not going to allow people to encroach upon their property, and that driveway comes right up to the edge of their property. So my suggestion is, if you, I, my suggestion first is, given the affidavits that you have here, that you shouldn't approve it because of what I'm showing to you. Um, the other thing I did want to put in also is that Mrs. Whitaker herself has put in, has her own affidavit, and in this affidavit, she recites how her father bought was now her and her husband's property in 1934. And she, has, and she was 69 years old. She's been familiar with that boundary, that property, since well before uh, 1934 because her grandparents lived, the, lived across the street. And she recites in that affidavit how she frequently rode down that old farm road that's shown in the photographs that you received. So, I, again, I'm not sure how, you, if, if you are inclined to approve this, how you're going to do it. But if you approve it, allowing the driveway to exist on the face of the earth where it shows in the applicant's plan, the, the Whitakers are not going to permit the, the land trust to have an independent right-of-way that would encroach upon their boundary, and thus there will be no separate right-of-way apart from what will go down the driveway itself. So for those reasons, I urge you that, that any approval, if you're inclined to give it, should require that the road, the driveway itself, shall be not less than 15 feet westerly of the Whitaker boundary, or of the common boundary. If you do that, then perhaps the issue might be left to the civil courts more easily, but if you prove it any other way, I think you're going to be creating further problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, follow up the presentation. The information can't be discussed in detail because of the late uh, hour. Um, we certainly uh, respect the work that you've gone to to demonstrate your concerns with respect to the boundary line. I think both with the recommendation of our town attorney and consistent with other planning board's uh, actions, uh, we will again leave this to be a civil matter. And it's my understanding that the plan that we have before us is a plan that we're approving and should the boundary line for any reason change, uh, that that plan would have to come back before the uh, planning board for approval. Is that a reasonable statement? <laughs> it, it depends on whether or not we find out about it and the code officer determines that it needs to come back to the board. Okay. Can I ask a question? I, I may have missed something, but <clears throat> if, if we approve this plan tonight and he yep, and starts uh, construction and all of a sudden, I don't know how, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't know how they prevent that from going forward, number one, if there is a dispute, if there if they can't prevent it from going forward and it starts construction, it turns out that the Whitakers are correct, 
um, what happens then? Does he have to move the roadway and repair whatever was done to the Whitaker's property? Well, the, the, I assume that's a question to me. Uh, anyone that might know the answer, I'm, I'm just, I feel like I'm sort of a fish out of water with this one. I don't know. I think a general response to that is the applicant is wholly at risk uh, <coughs> proceeding with the plan, and in turn, so are the people who are involved in developing that plan for whatever reasons. I mean, if the surveyor has sworn by, has signed the survey and, and has certified it and has written a letter justifying the survey, then the surveyor is, is certainly part of that chain. Uh, and again, this, as far as I'm concerned, is, uh, is a boundary issue. It's a civil matter. And uh, the planning board can only approve what it has in front of it and assumes is a legally signed, certified sur boundary survey uh, with a substantial letter attached to it. And again, I'm not an attorney. We have one attorney on the board. Uh, You're doing very well. <laughs> but that's the way I'd like to leave it. And I think the applicant understands as, as well as anyone that uh, they're certainly at risk if they proceed and, and, and spend good money developing a road and houses. And the, uh, uh, about his attorney has talked about a 15-foot setback, that boundary line, if it in fact isn't where it is, it could be 30 feet, it could be 20 feet. Nobody knows uh, until they resolve this issue. Um, so that there could be greater risk than, than even what the uh, abutter's attorney is suggesting. So, uh, well, then that brings me to light something else then. <coughs> Excuse me, if they go ahead and this is all pending and if the applicant wants to sell one of these houses, I mean, he's got title insurance problem. Potentially that's correct. Oh, I assume that's correct. But again, we have, a, we have a boundary survey that's been submitted as part of the plan that met the requirements. It's a certified, signed survey. It's a boundary survey. And that's all the board is approving tonight. We're not a legal entity. We're nothing more than that. We're just approving the documents that have been, not approving, but reviewing the documents that have been placed in front of us. I, and, I, and I don't want to get into the boundary discussion further, but I can tell you from several properties that I've been involved with, everybody has an idea of where their boundary is, and, and it's an art and a science in doing boundary surveys and title searches. And it's not unusual for people who have lived on property for a long time to have a sense of where the boundary is, not to always be correct. And the original information that we were provided that showed the stakes along the center line of the road was not a boundary survey. It was a... a it was a layout of the stakes according to where the butters had placed them, and the surveyor who located those in the field certified that they were field located. But he didn't certify that that was indeed the uh, common boundary line. The survey tonight does do Well, tonight is tonight. We haven't had time to review it, and we're certainly not going to get involved in the boundary dispute. <coughs> I think and that's between you and the applicant. Um, we'll review the documents based on the information that we have from the, from the applicant. And, caveat emptor in terms of, of the uh, approvals and anything that uh, deals with building permits thereafter. With that, uh, we've had all the information presented. Any further <coughs> comments or discussions? I entertain a motion. Ms. Parkhurst. <coughs> motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, Joel Fitzpatrick requires a wetlands alteration permit and public access where for the construction of a driveway and creation of two lots off of Scott Dyer Road. Number two, minor additions recommended by the town engineer are needed to assure that the development will be constructed as depicted on the plans. Number three, fee ownership of the land underlying the right of way should be clearly identified on the plans. Number four, the plans substantially comply with the wetlands alteration permit regulations section 19-3-9 and the public access waiver requirements section 19-4-2b. Therefore be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of Joel Fitzpatrick for wetlands alteration permit and public access waiver for the construction of a driveway and creation of two lots off of Scott Dyer Road be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, <coughs> excuse me, that the plans be revised in accordance with the town engineer's letter dated August 8, 1995. Number two, that the plans be revised to clearly indicate that fee ownership of the land underlying the right of way is to be part of lot one or lot two. We have a motion and a second. Second. Any discussion? 
I beg your pardon for being late. Uh, is there any thought that we would uh, adopt the recommendations in the land trust letter that's on the counter that's before us with respect to the right of way? I thought the applicant had already agreed to do that. It's, it's, I think, appropriate to make it a condition of approval. I think we have a, an oral uh, agreement to do that, but I think it's important to it's part of the record. Okay, then that would be... While you're mulling that over, I, anything else, Janet? <coughs> Were there any other changes that are... That Just the before? concern I had with respect to the, the nature of the screening. That's what, that's where I'm headed. Perhaps something along the line that, that the buffering plan be revised and submitted to the town planner in consultation with the planning board chair? That's, that's good. Yep. Makes a good rate number three. Okay. The three is a land trust, four is the, okay. the buffer. What do you want to do? Excuse me. Should we do land trust, land trust one too? Sure. Um, that the um, Cape Elizabeth Land Trust letter dated August 11th, 1995, uh, recommendations be um, adhered to. Well, actually, could we say that the, that the applicant will, will maintain a clear path along the right of way? That really is... At, at, at its expense. I think it's good to have the letter on the record so that when the land trust shows up to trim the shrubs, mm -hmm. uh, there's no question that they forewarned us. Okay. Anything else? No. So we have a motion. Uh, which has been seconded and amended. I agree to the amendments. Okay. All those in favor indicate by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. item under uh, on this evening's agenda is the first item under new business, the Coles Wetland Zoning Amendment. We discussed this in workshop briefly at the last meeting. A little background, Maureen. Sure. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Coles um, applied to uh, the code officer to put an addition on the front of their home. Unfortunately, their home is in the critical wetland buffer and the non-conforming provisions in the wetlands regulations state that you cannot expand the building footprint at any point that is closer to the wetland than the farthest point from the house. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the applicants could not put their addition on. They went to the council and asked for an amendment to the ordinance. This has been referred to the planning board. Um, in researching this issue, which, which the board dealt with two years ago, uh, the board had originally recommended that the setback for non-conforming structures, if you wanted to put an addition on, would be at a point where the house was, the, the addition would be no closer to the wetland than the existing home, which is a little bit more lenient than the, the language that was finally adopted by the council. Um, what happened at the last workshop is, is the board made a decision to re-recommend that original language so that what you're doing is taking uh, the statement that talks about the farthest non-conforming setback and changing that so that it now you're changing the word farthest to shortest non-conforming setback. And that's in section 19.3.9.12 and it's the third page of your memo. Any questions? No. Any? Ms. Ratz, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring this up at, at the, um, the workshop and, and I don't want to hold this up uh, at all. Um, the, the, my question is the second sentence um, and I just want to make sure we get it right the first time around. Is that a, is that a sentence? 
Um, the verb or the predicate is expand, but I'm not sure what it, if you read through that sentence, what expands. The sentence that starts in the case of any structure. Right. What's the noun of the, or the, the subject of the sentence? <laughs> Fair question. Yeah, and I looked through the structure of, of the other similar sections, and, and I thought maybe that just carries down the same type of phraseology, but it doesn't seem to. Um, and I think. You know, if we're going to correct this the way we wanted it to begin with, um, we just add a, a subject to the sentence. Is there an intro? What, what's the language? For well, that's what I look for. Does, does, the, <coughs> does the introduction to that end with a semicolon or anything and it doesn't end with a sentence? It just simply says, um, no exterior structural alteration or addition to any non-conforming structure of the life of the structure shall expand beyond the limitations set forth below, period gives the date of amendment. Then this is number two, of course, uh, under A. Mm -hmm. And it says, <coughs> three reads uh, as a sentence. Number, two, number one reads in a similar awkward way, but I'm not sure. Like I said, I don't want to hold it up a long time, but I think we might as well get the sentence structure so it's clear to the future years. Well, I think it should be before the word expand, no expansion shall be permitted, which expands the structure's floor area or volume by more than. Satisfies my question. It's fine with me. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. I assume there was another business letter. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't supposed to make sense. Can you help my son with his homework, please? <laughs> Staccato business letter. <laughs> Any other discussions? Everyone understands the issue of shortest setback? Okay. Uh, uh, one other question, Maureen. Uh, would it normally be uh, the purview of the planning board to have a hold a public hearing on a matter such as this as a, a recommendation for zoning amendment? The board has the option but is not required to hold a public hearing so you, that's your first decision is whether or not you want to hold a public hearing. I have a uh, show of hands of those who uh, wish to hold a public hearing in this matter. Thank you. The uh, council will hold a public hearing. Uh, with that, uh, do I have a, see a motion? Mr. Parker. Motion for the board to consider, consider, excuse me, be it ordered that based on the facts presented, the attached amendment as amended to the zoning ordinance regulating nonconforming structures in the RP1 critical wetland buffer be recommended to the town council for consideration. And Maureen, you got the uh, language that I'll, I'll second that. Second. All those in favor? Well, uh, could I have a little discussion, Tom? I'm sorry. Oh, certainly. Uh, but I know we talked about this in a workshop, but for some reason, we changed the or connector between number one and number two in the ordinance language itself from or to and. But that means that you have to have both an expansion I think that what we don't we mean that we're not allowing an expansion which is either 25 feet closer than 25 feet from the wetland edge mm -hmm. or closer than the shortest distance in other words either one of those would work no no in, in workshop we really said that it has to be both of those things the the idea was that you're not supposed to allow it to be any closer than the existing nonconformance which at but, this point is like 60 feet. Right. Okay. Right. But let's say this house is is very much um, not this particular home, but the the our, our model home is right. is actually is two feet from the wetland edge. 
Okay. Um, the council decided that in that case, we, we don't want to allow, even if, it's, even if it's an existing structure, we don't want to allow an expansion in that area. You have to be at least 25 feet away from the edge to even consider an expansion. Right. So it needs to meet both of these, doesn't it? If we've got a house that's two feet from the wetland edge right now. And the shortest non-conforming setback distance would be two feet. So the only addition could be starting at 25 feet from the wetland edge. Reverses the criteria. The problem with before no, it didn't have. What it would do it would if you had or, it would knock it out under both circumstances. If you had something that was within two feet of the wetland edge, it would be number one. It would be closer than 25 feet, so you couldn't do it. And number two, it would be closer than the shortest setback distance, so you couldn't do it. But there would just be two reasons to knock it out rather than one. I'm thinking about a house that's 35 feet back. Um, you could, if you said no building, expan no building footprint expansion should be permitted, which is located closer than the shortest non-conforming setback and closer than 25 feet, then it seems to me that you can't do it closer than, let's see, I don't know exactly what the, what the, what the answer to that one is under this language, but under the or language, you couldn't go more than 25 feet and you couldn't get closer than the, the shortest distance. I, I, I followed everything you said up until the conclusion, which was seemed not to follow from whatever else you had said. All I can tell you is the way it was written before with the or was approved by the town attorney. We subsequently had a member of the zoning board who is also an attorney review this and say that this is not what we meant. So I'm of the opinion, I think, at this particular moment that no matter what we say, it's not going to be interpreted the way we meant it to be. <laughs> Well, it, the, the problem with the way it was written before, prior was that without the word either, it was unclear. Mm -hmm. And we had that instance in another ordinance that was taken to court where <coughs> the court question was that a typographical error. And I think going forward, we should always make sure that we at least try to take care of these either ors, mm -hmm. neither nors. Um, but I, I see what, and in, in logic, there's a, there's a term for that right. progression of logic, but um, I, I think that. Um, you, what you're trying to, to omit is the, the requirement for or the, the ability to bring a, an expansion up to 25 feet from the wetland edge. Because without the either or, neither nor, something and, um, it makes it difficult to interpret the second part of the criteria. I know what you're, you're, you're getting, but I still think that this is the correct. Um, okay, well, let's, let's, so let, let's, let's take the example of something that's 90 feet away. And we're not talking about extend, expanding more than 25%, so we're not falling into the first sentence. And um, the second sentence says we can't expand up to 25%. So far, so good. Now we're on the third sentence. In the RP1 zone, no building footprint expansion shall be permitted, which is located closer than the shortest, ah, and closer than 25 feet. I think you're right. With the missing piece there is in the no illogical conclusion <laughs> that, that they simply don't want anything expanded, even if it's sitting back 90 feet, in the buffer area. I, I don't, See, there is a third I don't have any objection to uh, referring this back to the town attorney. I think the, the real issue here is the shortest non-conforming setback in terms of the, the board's recommendation. And the board would like to again have this referred to town attorney to deal with the uh, conjunction or preposition. I really think it should be or. I really do, because when you're in the, at the 90-foot level, you, you can expand 
you can expand, you, no expansion is permitted closer than the shortest, which is the 90 feet back, mm -hmm. or no. closer no. than 25 feet, because you don't care. Otherwise, if you said that it was and 25 feet back, This, this, the way it's written here creates that, that no man's land between the 25 foot area and the actual existing with any example given whether it's 90 to 25 and, and, and the wishes of the council is no, we don't want expansion. If that is a situation where it's sitting 90 feet back, we don't care. It's not going uh, uh, to go any... It's going to up to 25 feet. Yes, but if it's 90 feet, you're not going to get any closer than 90 feet. Uh, Marina's suggestion that uh, before number one we use the word uh, neither and instead of uh, and we use the word nor Ooh. let me change that wait a minute, where? oh before it was located neither closer than the shortest not conforming setback distance from the wetland edge nor closer than 25 feet from That's the fine. wetland edge that says the same thing but that means or instead of any, so are we, mm -hmm. are we on board with mm -hmm. that? It's neither yeah. one nor the other. other. Nor the other. Mm -hmm. I, and again, I don't, and as it probably does as a matter of course, to have the town attorney review and approve that language. No expansion shall be permitted which is located neither. That's not grammatically correct. No, it isn't. Which is correct. neither located. No. Or, so you don't want to do, um, just take out the first no, filling Just footprint expansion yeah, shall <coughs> be prevented. Expansion, how about building footprint expansion shall not be. <laughs> if you put the not in there, you've got to create a double negative with the neither nor. Oh, man. How about either or instead of neither nor? But then the criteria that they wanted to, to, for both criteria to, to be uh, applicable. Here's building foot at, for but structures not. located in the buffer. A building footprint expansion. More seems to work. But. Yeah, that's what we originally had. Yeah. Okay, how about building footprint expansion shall be permitted, which is neither located closer than nor closer than. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Taking the Put, put the footprint neither footprint before expansion, located. Building footprint expansion shall be permitted, provided <laughs> that it is not located closer than or closer than? Then you can't use the neither nor structure. And you have to keep the first clause in, in the, in the affirmative. I don't think this is an attorney's, a town attorney's question. I think we can figure it out if we just have the yeah. time to do it. But um. uh, The intent is that uh, the, uh, the expansion can't be closer than the non-conforming uh, uh, setback, and it can't be closer than 25 feet. All right, so say this, for structures located in the buffer, it has to be comma. And. It has to be and, because <coughs> the non-conforming setback could be closer than 25 mm -hmm. feet, so it has to be and. It has to be either and or neither nor. And I think the problem with, I, then, I mean, I'm happy with the way it's written right now. I mean, before we made the change, it, it was proofed by various bodies and, and, and it was okay. But then we had one person say that, what you could do is interpret this to mean that you only had to meet one mm -hmm. of the two criteria. Because the word either was not in the right. original text. That's why every time it says or or either, it, it implies you have an option. Now, I wouldn't interpret it that way, but, you know, when, when people need to do something, they will take the ordinance to its um, to But the point no where. expansion is permitted, which is A or B. Yes. means to me if it's A it's not permitted if it's B it's not permitted. It's the way it's always meant to me. But somebody interpreted that in another way? 
you know, a, a simple suggestion here. We're having, we're wrestling with this. We're supposedly more conversant with this um, language than a typical lay person. Uh, it might be easier just to go with the A and B situation. Actually, use A and B. Still have to. Then it eliminates the confusion. You mean just break it into two sentences? Yep. That's yeah. fine. Colon, you know, the, the following um, criteria. Um, no building footprint expansion should be permitted, which is located closer than the shortest blah blah. And no building footprint expansion shall be mitted, permitted, which is located closer than blah blah. Then that's about Can't be any clearer than that, right? right. <coughs> that's what we want to do. Here, here. Is blah spelled with an H? Just <laughs> <laughs> <It's> three blahs. <laughs> you wait. So the period we come out after the word edge. So no building footprint expansion shall be permitted, which is located, scratch the one, closer than the shortest non-conforming setback distance from the wetland upland edge, comma. No, period. Period. Well, you could period or comma, and then you could say. <coughs> Semicolon. And no building footprint expansion shall be permitted, which is located, then finish the sentence. Would it be easier to go, which is colon A, um, closer than the shortest non-conforming? Then, then you get to the same problem about or or and. No, we don't, because they're separate. They're, then they're separate issues. <coughs> that we're not linking them with an and or an or. We're just we're completely separating them by A and B, or one and two, whatever you want to do it with. But they're separated by that now. Excuse me. They're separated by one and two. Well, but it doesn't read that clearly this way. I too have, really have no problem with it as written, but others seem to. What this, uh, what this almost reads, if we use the word "and," is that you could have a, an addition that might an expansion that might be closer than the shortest non-conforming setback, but not closer than 25 feet. Exactly. Exactly. So that's that's, that's the, the argument that they would that's make. That's the gap that we need to deal with. Do you want to just go back to breaking up into two sentences? That's that's the clearest. Okay. Do you have those? Yes. You want to read them for us? For structures located in the resource protection one critical wetland buffer, no building footprint expansion shall be permitted, which is located closer than the shortest non-conforming setback distance from the upland edge, period. For structures located in the resource protection one critical wetland buffer, no building footprint expansion shall be permitted, which is closer than 25 feet from the wetland edge, period. Good. Fine. Acceptable. Won't pass English. But that's fine. It's clear. A lot of work. Right. All right. Just so the board knows, there is, a, there is an Appendix D that illustrates this, and the illustration is a lot clearer than the language, so. Will the Appendix have to be changed? Yes. That's my expectation. Should we include that with the? Yes. The, with the motion? Yes. Okay. Let's designate the town. It's fine with me. Appendix D. Was there a motion? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. And <coughs> as I made the motion, I'll um, amend the motion to read as we have just, uh, as the town planner has just um, read. Okay. All those in favor? Any further discussion? All yes, those in favor? A second, I think. Mr. Cotter seconded. Um, Mr. Hetzel did this. Yeah, oh, that was acceptable to me. <coughs> to add those first. We can deal with these 90 minutes subdivisions. <laughs> All those in favor indicate by raising your right hand. Right. Passes to the council. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Sorry, I brought it up. Time has come back to us. We don't want it to come back to us at this point.
Any other items? No. Okay. There will be, uh, for the workshop pack, there will be parking. Yeah, we'll be getting the source. Um, I, I should have mentioned it to the board at the last workshop, but the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee, as you are aware, is, is working on rewriting the ordinance. Janet is the Planning Board's re representative. They're going to be finishing up probably right around the end of this year, and they have requested, if the board is interested, um, would you like to forward to them comments on the public access waiver and the site plan standards provisions in the zoning ordinance. Are there things that you would like to see changed based on your perspective? And if you can get these to them by the mid by mid October, they can take into consideration in rewriting the zoning ordinance. So when talking with the planning board chair, it was agreed that this would be on the September workshop. So you know if you can think about that, maybe uh, bring a list of your comments with you to the workshop. Things that seem to be recurring issues with respect to either ordinance that should be addressed. Mm -hmm. I was actually quite pleased that the zoning ordinance review commission asked for the planning board's comments, <laughs> so um, it was a nice uh, suggestion. <coughs> I think it'd be good to have some early input if we have the time. Terrific. Thank you. Any other issues? All those in I'll, I'll make a motion that the meeting is adjourned. Second. Second. All those in favor? I'm sure you got page nine for the point of view. I don't need that. So, she doesn't get the.